are watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Good evening and welcome to As I See It, A Blind Woman's View. My name is Andrea Judici and I am your host and tonight I'm also the guest. It's kind of cool, I get to be two, two things in one night. I have with me my guide dog. As always, I'm not introducing him. That is for our safety as a team and for his focus. So here we are at the beginning of a new year and a lot of people make resolutions and I don't like the word resolution because that has a little too much pressure to it, but I try to make some commitments to myself about things that I might change or do better or improve upon. And one of them this year is my commitment to trying to be more patient when confronted with many of the situations I find myself in almost daily that highlight to me the myths about blindness that are held by so many people. And in an attempt to start that goal, I'm going to talk about them tonight. And I figured I always try to have an expert on the show, someone who can really highlight a topic and talk knowledgeably about it. And one thing I absolutely know I'm an expert on is being a blind person, because I've been one for a really long time. So that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight, are some of the common myths that myself and, and blind people that I know and have spoken with have highlighted to me as the ones that are the most frustrating to deal with. And the first one, and, and maybe even the most important at the base of it all, is that this feeling is, if you've met one p blind person, you've met them all. There seems to be a sense that blind people are the same, we're all the same. And that, so if you encounter someone who's blind and you find them to be rude or you think that they have, um, you know, a lack of ambition or, they, or they're very friendly or they're a lawyer or whatever it is, there's this perception that every blind person will be that way. So I encourage you to think about the fact that if you had 15 or 20 or 500 sighted people in one place, it, we would never expect them to be all the same, to have the same beliefs and feelings and opinions, to like the same food, to have the same job, to know the same people. But if you have two blind people, in the same place, or 500, or 1,000. There is the expectation that we all believe the same things, like the same food, do the same job, um, and know each other, even if we're from other parts of the world. So that's a really important thing, and I know that it sounds very basic and simplistic, but you'd be amazed at how often I find that that's not what is the general feeling about blind people. And I'm going to use the word blind people or people who are blind. I'm referring to anyone who's dealing with um, legal blindness, total blindness. So just I'm just going to use that term because it gets awkward to say blind and visually impaired and whatever. And I'm a blind person, so that's what I'm going to use. Um, another thing that I find very interesting is that people either think that, I, that, blind, that, that someone who's blind has ultra awesome super hearing or it has no hearing at all. So either people are shouting at me from very close because they think I can't hear them, or they think that I was born with supersonic, really awesome special hearing because I'm blind. Well, the reality is that unless someone has a dual disability and is also deaf, blindness does not mean that there is a lack of hearing. It also doesn't mean that I was born with better hearing. Even though I was born blind, it means that because I'm not using vision as a sense to experience the world, my sense of hearing 
has gotten more acute. I've learned to pay more attention to the environment around me and to utilize my hearing much more than most sighted people do. If, if, if I could walk into a room and simply look around and learn the geography of the room, that would certainly be faster and easier. Since that's not an option, the next choice is to listen. And so that's why you, it might seem that a blind person has supersonic hearing, but really it's just better utilized. Um, <clears throat> another thing that is very common when I get asked questions is the, the perception that all people who are blind are completely in the dark, that there's no visual input at all. And we've even addressed this in, in other shows previous to this one, only about 5% of the population who are blind are actually totally blind without any kind of light perception or usable vision. So that's a really important thing um, to remember. Now, when you meet someone who's blind, you're, it, it, it's not appropriate to be like, oh, how blind are you? I get asked that. I actually get asked that question a lot. Well, how blind are you before I give you these directions? And I think what someone's really trying to figure out is if I point, do you have enough vision to see that I'm pointing to that orange sign, as opposed to having to use non-color, um, non-visual cues to, to, to guide you? But that's an important thing, that, that, that all blind people, in fact, few blind people are actually living in total darkness, and there's various <clears throat> levels of, of vision and vision loss and, and usable vision. Um, Another thing that is really interesting to me is I get asked a lot if I can, even though I was born blind, if I can see in my dreams. And I think this comes from, uh, well, I'm not sure where it comes from, but the reality is that if you were born blind and you've never been able to see, then you're not going to be able to see in your dreams because you can't do in your dreams what you can't do when you're awake. Well, at least I can't. Um, maybe someone with superpowers can. Um, However, if someone lost their vision due to an accident or a, a, um, an illness or, or a, um, some, sort of dis some sort of blindness where they lost their vision beyond the point where they had memory and could see, most of the people that I talk to who've done that do actually see in their dreams. They have visual, they go back to their visual memories in their dreams. What's interesting about that is that, so let's say someone loses their vision when they're 23. So until they were 23, they were a seeing person, and then they became a blind person. In their dreams, they will be able to see, but not see anything that they've, not to see any updated things from when they were 23. So, so when they're 52 and they, and they dream, they're, the people in their lives that they could see when they were 23 are going to be the same age they were back then. They're not going to be able to age those people in their head. So that's kind of interesting. Um, but I, I, get a, I get asked that question quite a bit. And I thought it was an important thing just to sort of to highlight. Um, <clears throat> and so this was an interesting thing that happened to me. And, and I, I swear, I'm, the stories that I tell tonight, I'm not making them up. <laughs> they just are real. I was out to dinner with a bunch of my friends, all of whom happened to be blind. And we were having a great time, you know, socializing, laughing, talking, eating. And our server came over at one point and said, wow, are you guys all from a home? And I kind of went, hmm, we all have homes. But I, there was this perspective that if there was a group of blind people all out together, that we must be from some sort of, air quotes, home, some, some specialized living situation where we all lived communally and had a caretaker. And I just think that's very interesting because I've, I don't believe that a bunch of sighted people sitting around at a dinner ta at a table in a restaurant would have that same question asked of them. And that brings up the perspective and the, and the belief sometimes that people have that blind people aren't able to perform the, the activities of daily living that would enable us to live independently. I get asked a lot, well, do you cook? Do you clean? Who, who cleans your house? I wish I had a housekeeper. I wish I had a chef. Um, I don't have either of those things. So it's, it's, it's important to remember that while I may not use my eyes to um, be the primary input when I'm doing things like cooking or cleaning, but that doesn't mean that they can't be done. I know from talking to children but also adults, that we live in such a visual world, 
it's hard to imagine doing the things that you do without being able to see because as a sighted person, you can always see when you do them. So there's a misguided sort of impression that they couldn't be done if you couldn't see. And that's really not true and a really important thing to remember because if someone were sighted and now, you know, in later life loses their vision or you meet a person who's blind maybe in a job interview or somewhere and you need to remember that that person has gotten up that day, they've gotten themselves dressed, they've gotten their breakfast, they've left their house, they've gotten to wherever it is that you're meeting them and they've done all that independently without the, without, without needing to use their vision to accomplish those tasks. And I know, again, as I, as I listen to myself say this, I, I suspect you're sitting there in your living room going, well, duh, of course. But I can promise you that being asked these kind of questions all the time, everywhere I go, I can assure you that this isn't as obvious as it might seem. And so that's why I want to talk about it tonight, because it's so important to try to dispel myths and to try to bring everyone onto an equal playing field when it comes to understanding about people who are not the same as, as they are, whether it's blindness or some other disability. And here's a real good one. This one's awesome. This one that I am thinking about is that people have a feeling that when you meet a blind person, we are awesomely good at recognizing voices. And if we've met you once, we're going to remember your voice and be able to attach a name to it no matter how long it's been since we saw you. And this happens to me all the time and it's really hard. Someone will say, hi, Andrea, it's me. And if any of you have ever answered a phone, this would, pre this would be the precede when there was actually caller ID. You pick up the phone and the person goes, hi. And you're like, hi. And they're like, it's me. And you have no idea who that person is. That's how, what happens to me. So if I'll run into a neighbor on the street or, or in my neighborhood or in the grocery store and they'll say, hi, Andrea, how are you doing? And they won't identify themselves as to who they are. And so I know I know them and I'm perfectly happy to be cordial, but I can't, I don't know who that person is necessarily, especially if it's someone that I've only just met or it's in a very, it's out of context. I, you know, they are my neighbor, but I'm actually running into them on, you know, somewhere in a totally different town. We happen to be at the same movie theater or something. So, so I always encourage someone, it's never going to be a problem to say, Hey, Andrea, it's Joan. Or, hey, Andrea, it's Melissa. Either I will have recognized your voice and I'll know that, or I'll be so grateful that you said it, that it won't, I'll never be, it will never be a problem of being offended if you use your name, give me your name when you talk to someone. Um, now remember that the, the opinions that I'm giving you here tonight, they are I, predominantly mine. I, I started the show by saying that we're all different. So I can tell you tonight all the things that I think are important. And then you'll meet some blind person who will tell you that girl is crazy. She doesn't know anything. Everything she said is wrong. So I'm, I'm giving you situations and myths that I encounter and my belief on how to deal with them and, and, and how to correct them. I'm not saying that I'm right. I'm saying that this is how I go about it and most of the people I know, but I can't promise you that every blind person you meet will feel the same way. Um, just, I want to put that out there sort of as a, as a disclaimer. A funny thing that happened to me when I was working in San Francisco, every day when I waited for the bus, for the commuter bus, there were about six or seven of us that all waited the same time for the same bus. And every single day, this same woman would come and beg from us. She was a homeless woman. There's a lot of homeless people in San Francisco begging. And every day she would come and she would go to each person in that group and she would ask them for money and she never asked me. And at first I was really offended. I'm like, you know, I can't believe this woman isn't begging from me. I clearly I'm in a better place than her. I'm leaving work and she's homeless and I'm getting on a commuter bus to go to the suburbs. And, and then I went, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> it's probably okay in this particular instance because being begged from every day is tedious. But I have other friends who are blind who have had people make the assumption that they don't have money. My brother was waiting at a bus stop the other day and a couple of women came up to him and they said, sir, are you hungry? And he said, well, yeah, it's early. I haven't had breakfast. And they're like, do you need clothing? Do you need a place to live? And he's like, um, I'm a professor. <laughs> it's all good. So even though he was headed off to university to, to do his job as a professor, they saw a blind person waiting for a bus. And even though their intention was kindness, 
they still made an assumption that he was homeless and hungry. He just figured he probably just looked a little disreputable that day, hadn't dressed him, hadn't paid him much of attention to how he got dressed that day. I'm not sure, but it, it does happen where someone's asking to break a large bill somewhere and they're asking everyone and they go to the blind guy and go, oh no, sorry, you don't have any money, you're blind. I have a friend that happened to. And it's, it's, it's not just the immediate of being discredited in a group of people, but the implicit belief system that would lead to why does a blind person have no money? Well, because they can't do a job, because how could a blind person have, a, have, have meaningful, gainful employment? There's all these assumptions that go into that. And that is very, very negative and is not going to help people who are blind and looking for work to be seen as a viable candidate. And I know I've, I've had people say to me, and I've been approached in the grocery store or in a restaurant or at a bus station or in the airport or pretty much anywhere that I am. And people will ask me things like, how did you get dressed this morning? How, how did, how, how, and I, and I think to myself, wow. So this person can't even picture themselves being able to perform basic tasks as a blind person. And if they look at me and they can't imagine how I got dressed this morning independently, how will that person as a hiring manager ever uh, imagine me as a viable candidate as an employee? How will that person as a bank manager ever imagine me as a viable candidate for a loan? It's very, very um, discouraging. And it's no one's fault. I'm in no way saying that it's people are doing it to be mean, but it's, it's very worrisome, which is part of why I wanted to do this show, because I think the more times it can be said, the more people that hear it, 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 it can't hurt. Um, and so that's, as I said, another, uh, another reason why I'm doing it. One of the questions I get asked an awful lot is, well, Andrea, what about these quote unquote visual words? How do I talk, you know, someone will come up and, they, and they're talking about, uh, the other night, hair, hairspray live, uh, hairspray was on the TV live. It was performed live, and it was being talked about a lot the next day at work. And there was this, cons like, you know, I wanted to jump right in that conversation. Oh yeah, I watched it or I didn't watch it. And people don't want to use visual words. Did you see the news? Did you see that story on the news last night? Did you watch Big Bang last night? Um, see you later. They don't want to use those words because there's a fear that it will be offensive. And I can, I can only speak for myself, but I know that I'm never offended. In fact, it's so awkward when someone tries to have a conversation and never use a visual word. Andrea, it's really good to hear you. Did you listen to the news last night? I, I can't wait to take in that show tomorrow. It, just, it, it takes so much energy to think about how to not use words that we all use so naturally. So I encourage everyone, first and foremost, I'm a person. I'm a person, I happen to be blind, I also happen to be 5'5", five five, and I'm a, I'm a woman person as opposed to a man person. Um, those are all things about me, but first and foremost, I am a person, and that's what I um, really encourage people to think about. And I encourage people to think about that when they want to, when you, when, if you happen to be in a circumstance where you're in a restaurant, or you're in a grocery store, or like I said, at an airport, or anywhere public and you encounter someone who's blind, there are so many questions, I understand that, that people want to know, how, do, how, do, how does she get dressed? How does she match her shoes? How does she, how does she get here? How does she do her shopping? And, and I really value that knowing the answers to those questions would really be interesting and would really help someone to understand about blindness because blindness is so scary. We live in such a visual world. I have had people say to me they would rather be dead than be blind. They would rather have any other disability than be blind. So I understand that, that it's sort of like, here's, my, here's the one blind person I've ever met. Oh my gosh, I have to ask those questions because I've been dying to know all my life. And I, and I try very much to be sympathetic to that. On the other hand, I am in fact, not just blind, I'm a person who's trying to get my grocery shopping done or trying to catch a plane or walking down the sidewalk having a conversation or maybe I'm at dinner with a girlfriend from college or I'm on a date 
And the last thing I really want to do is spend my evening answering someone else's questions that they would never ask to, another, to, a, to anyone in that restaurant who wasn't disabled. Again, I'm not trying to tell, I'm, I'm certainly not trying to, to, to tell, to, to make the statement that I think the world is, that people are intentionally mean, but I think it's really, I, I just know that it's very important to remember that I am not an exhibit in a museum. I'm a living person going about living my life. And there are times when I don't want to, or it's inappropriate for someone to interrupt me to answer their questions when I'm trying to, to go about my day and, and, and catch a plane or have a meal or have a conversation. So I ask people just to, to remember that when you deal with someone with a disability. Um, there is also a, an, a really interesting point that I want to make, and this is something I feel really, really strongly about. I have been told countless times, almost every time I have a conversation about blindness with people, the, they say to me something to the effect, well, you were born blind, so I guess it's better because you don't have anything, you don't know what you're missing. So I guess you don't have to mourn your blindness. And again, while I understand that there is absolutely no hurt intended, it's really important to know that I'm willing to bet that anybody out there who's never been able, who, who, who's never had chocolate or who doesn't have as much money as the next person doesn't know that having more chocolate or having money wouldn't be a nice thing to do. And I, t I, I say this because while someone who loses their vision certainly has a very different experience with the mourning of the loss of their vision, and they have a different learning curve as to how to learn to be a blind person, I also think it's important to value the frustration and pain and loss that comes with never having seen. I couldn't pick myself out of a lineup if I had to. I don't know what my mother looks like. I can't um, experience so much of the world that is visual. And that doesn't mean that I, my life is less, because that's another thing people believe. Well, somehow my life must be subpar if I can't experience things visually. And I don't think that at all. I think I live just as full a life. In fact, I think I live a fuller life than many people who are sighted. I think that's a personality thing more than a blindness or non-disability thing. But it's very hurtful to me when I think that people don't, don't realize that it's not, it's not just all you know, fun and, 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 and joy and no sadness um, when you, when I, to, to have never had vision. And I, and I, again, just say that because it's very important to me for people just to realize it. And everything I'm talking about tonight comes down to just thinking. Thinking before we speak, regardless of whether it's about blindness or anything else. And also to just sort of think your questions through and, and see, is this really the appropriate time or place to ask that question? I'm reading Braille notes and I get asked a lot, Braille is becoming less and less common. And I get asked a lot that because of so many things being, there's so many technological advances. Everyone's got an iPhone, or many, most people have an iPhone, they've got computers, there's audio books. Is Braille really important anymore? That's the question that I get asked. And I will, I will tell you that Braille is critical. Braille is my native written language. I love Braille. Plus it's cool, I can read it in the dark. It's awesome. Um, but to not teach Braille to someone who, to, to a blind person who needs to read Braille as opposed to, to, to print is like not teaching a sighted child print even though they probably have a tablet and a computer and a smartphone in their future. We ha in until we're never teaching anybody how to read and write print, it's, it's, that's the only time when not teaching Braille would even be, cons I could even think of that as being appropriate. Because to not teach Braille when you're teaching print to sighted people, that's, that's, that's a travesty. Um, there's some interesting myths I've encountered about guide dog use, and these are kind of interesting. So I get told a lot that people think that if someone uses a guide dog, it means that they're a, a more accomplished or better traveler than someone who uses a long cane. 
And that's really not true. They're, they're the, to be able to use a guide dog, you have to be able to use and, and travel safely with the long white cane with the red tip. That is true. Having said that, as a guide dog, as a cane user, I would, I would absolutely not win any kind of medals in the cane Olympics. I am, I am a competent cane traveler. I am certainly not an expert or, or phenomenal cane traveler. I know people who, go, who do more things and, and are on a more accomplished traveler with their cane than I am with my dog. So I think it's important to know that it's, a, it's mostly about a choice when you use a guide dog, not that someone who uses a guide dog is, 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 a, is better or smarter than someone who uses a cane. Um, that's just not at all true. Um, the, there is an interesting myth that the guide dog knows exactly where to go. All I have to give them is the name of the destination. So there's this belief that I could say to my dog, I'm going to use the name Juno. Juno, let's go to Walgreens and off we'll go. And in fact, I believed this before I got my first guide dog. I thought, oh my gosh, this is awesome. I'm never going to have to know where to go anymore. I'm going to I'm, the dog's going to do all of it. It's so cool. And I could be in Connecticut or California or India. And I can say, find McDonald's. And my dog will somehow magically know how to find the closest McDonald's and get me there. It's not quite like that. The way that the guide dog works is as part of a team. And so I need to know how to get where I'm going. And the guide dog needs to follow those directions. And this leads into the next thing that I think is so interesting, which is that many, many, many people have watched someone at a, at a street crossing. The light turns, it's time for them to cross. The guide dog steps off the curb and off they go. And it looks to the person watching like the person hasn't said anything to their guide dog. Therefore, there's a belief that my dog can actually tell the difference between a red light and a green light. And that, oh my God, and that is not true. Um, it's my, it's, it's, it's my job to determine when it's safe to cross. And then it's my job to tell the dog to do that and his job to do it. So he doesn't read his, he doesn't read the lights, which is, um, if he got that smart, I'd be in trouble. Um, so I've, I've touched upon some of the most important things. Blind people are not all the same. We're just as different and diverse in what we like and what we, and what we do and what we believe as sighted people. That even though there's a lot of interesting things to be learned to, by talking to someone who's blind, because it's hard to imagine living your life without vision, first and foremost, a person who is blind, who's out and about in the world, is out and about in the world being a person, doing things that they need to get done. And just think about whether or not what you're asking them, even though you really, really, really want to know the answer, is it really a question that you would want to be asked by a stranger? Remember that blind people are doing all kinds of jobs and, and having the same kind of struggles and doing the same kind of things at home with friends, with family, having children, being married, being unemployed, being employed as sighted people. That being blind is a lot of things but it's just one thing about the person who is blind. And I, and I know that, again, many of you watching this know that, and I know to a lot of you I'm preaching to the choir, but if I can just help one person learn and, 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 and figure this out, that would be really great. I can't believe my time is up. This is, as, you, as I see it, a blind woman's view. If you have any questions or comments, email us at ablindwomansview@gmail.com. at gmail.com. Thank you so much for watching and have a fabulous month.